Break with us, Max uh, came from Kitchener area. Cambridge, well, Kitchener, some, Cambridge, yeah. somewhere around there to talk to us a little bit and give us the same presentation that he did at VM World this year, just a scaled down version of it. And, uh, so thanks, man. Yeah. And as Mike mentioned, you know, I'm uh, here to give you guys a, a short talk here on an intro to uh, designing disaster recovery and business continuity. So, first off, some quick info about myself. I'm an IT manager by day, um, VMware V expert, being Vanguard, Matt.IT guy on Twitter. Uh, you find my ramblings at 42u.ca, and uh, just a quick little shameless plug for myself. I run a Veeam user group out of Mississauga, so if anyone's interested, feel free to hit me up for info after this. So, why do I want to talk about DR? It tends to be one of those things that as IT professionals, we're probably quite familiar with the concept, you know, the same with business continuity. Hopefully we have plans where we are, but a lot of us probably haven't had to make one from scratch. And, you know, even if we have, it's the type of thing that you really need to review fairly often in order to make sure it's still up to date. But as time goes on, you know, your data center might be expanding, uh, you might have new considerations. So you want to make sure you're staying on top of that sort of stuff. You don't want to be pulling a thing out and realize that you haven't planned for something. So we'll get some terminology out of the way here right off the get-go. You know, disaster recovery, well, you, know, you have some sort of disaster. This is when you're trying to recover from it, right? Usually it's a matter of trying to get data back to the users. The cause of that disaster could be any number of things, but at the end of the day, we need to get folks back up Business continuity, on the other hand, is typically how do we keep the business going? Uh, these would be at least sort of, sort of some of the key uh, business processes that you need to identify and the business needs these to operate. Then you've got your RPO, which is your recovery point objective, which is more or less how much will we lose. So if we have a RPO of 15 minutes, that means our, you know, our last backups are from, let's say, 15 minutes ago. And then your recovery time objective, that's how long will it take us to actually recover back to the RPO. So the first phase, you know, I've, I've divvied these up into four phases on the DR side. Uh, what you want to do first is you want to identify your risks. So these would typically be your points of failure. Um, so, you know, I've got infrastructure failures up there. This could be server failure, could be uh, network switch failure. It could be, you know, your, your fiber feed coming in. All those things are types of failures. But you've also got to consider things like data loss. You know, so yeah, you, you what what this data is stolen? Usually that's much more heavy on the security side of things. But it could still invoke your DR plan depending on the organization. Um, crypto locker, that's going around a lot. What happens if all your data gets you know, zapped by that? Technically, it's pretty secure. You just don't have the decryption key at that point. <laughs> um, and you know, I've got the user and the overbearing assistants. Anyone familiar with the Lego movie might know her. Uh, but I like to think of them as, you know, uh, maybe it's the uh, the junior net admin who accidentally drops the wrong database, or what's very common that I've seen in my organization, the users who drag the root level folder into another share and say, oh, I don't know what happened. Data's gone. <laughs> so those are all actually points of failure that can lead to a DR situation because it removes the data. So what you want to do is identify these sort of areas that you're prone to and who's responsible for these areas. Who needs to be in the loop? Uh, these will likely be people from the IT side, depending on how your teams are organized. But it's likely also going to be on the business side of things, too. Who, who are the managers there? Who are the key users? Um, who's going to be able to give you the information that you need, if you need it, from that side of the office? Phase two will be your triage stage. So uh, this is a bit of a military term, but it's where you go in and you assess the damage. Instead of just putting out fires right away, you want to figure out what's damaged, what's most critical. So ideally, you want to assign these values ahead of time to say, hey, you know what, um, payroll takes precedent over everything else because people won't work for free, regardless <laughs> of disaster or not. 
Uh, they might have things like, you know, we got to get sales and marketing back up and running because they create the revenue, um, you know, accounting after that. And you'll want to get somewhat granular because, you know, once again, we to take a look at accounting. Okay, what's more important, AR or AP? That's going to be a talk that you have with those people that you identified in phase one. Now, don't forget dependencies. I like to use an example of, let's say you've got a database cluster that goes down. It's hosting your accounting software, but it's also hosting a lot of the work from your um, web developers. Well, your web developers will come back screaming at you saying, hey, we got to get the web servers back up and running. OK, cool, you could do that. But if your database server isn't back up and running either, there's going to be nothing for them to do. Meanwhile, if you bring your database server up first, you might be able to get accounting back online. And there's going to be no real time loss for the web guys because you will have to do that anyways. So try to map them out. Hopefully, it doesn't look anything like that. <laughs> um, you know, straight line, single color. Hopefully, you have that in your environment, but who knows? And at this stage, you want to start communicating. Even though you haven't necessarily started to resolve the issues yet, um, let folks know hey, we're looking into this. Um, Keep them apprised of once you decide which avenue you're going, as far as we're going to deal with this department first, followed by that one. Keep them in the loop because people always want information. Sometimes it might be a matter of, you know what, nothing's changed in the past hour, but we want to let you know that we don't forget about you. So once you sort of get those, uh, the triage, triage stage done and you figure out where you want to go next, uh, now is when we basically get into the recovery stage. And this is where most of the work's going to come in at the time we need to do this. So first thing you need to do is put the plan into action. This is where you pull out your plan, you figure out, you know what's gone down now, map up to what values you assigned previously uh, as far as what order you would bring these up in. After that, start thinking about how are you actually going to recover? So there's plenty of options out there. So at what point do you look at you know, doing a full site failover versus, hey, you know what, maybe we could just bring this machine or cluster back up versus maybe it's just an application problem. So consider those things. I mean, you might be able to do something as simple as reinstalling an application. It might be good to go. You won't want to fail over a whole site because of that. But this might also be a matter of, you know what, we've got rules where we say we spend half an hour trying to fix the app. Uh, if we can't get going after that, we'll spend up to two hours trying to get the server back up and running. If we can't go after, you know, get going after that, we look at doing some sort of failover. And it may not even be a full site failover. It might be some sort of cluster failover. Um, once again, highly dependent on your environment. But if you can figure these values out ahead of time, it saves you from sitting there questioning yourself, how long should I be banging away at this thing, trying to get it going? Um, ideally, whenever we set up new software, it should be documented. I know that's you know, best practice, how often <laughs> that actually happens. Um, you know, once again, even if it's a matter of next, 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 finish, even that's handy to know that you use all the default settings. Because uh, if you're at option one, trying to get the application rebuilt, you don't want to be searching around for things like uh, license keys, you know, how many users do we have for this, what users are allowed to use this. And you know, are there any specific user settings? You might have you know, that CFO or the CEO who doesn't care that you're recovering from a disaster. He wants his background picture to be you know, a picture of his kids or something like that. Might sound silly, but if it's one of those things where you can take the extra 30 seconds to do that ahead of time, and avoid having that C-level exec breathing down your neck until it gets done, might be worthwhile. But you know that also holds, holds true to um, things like printers. I know in my uh, accounting environment, we have specific print drivers that need to be used when it comes to printing checks. It'd be awfully silly if you're able to get the whole application back up and running, but accounting can't actually do one of the functions that they need to do. Encryption. Not the crypto locker type, but uh, do you use encryption? If you find yourself trying to recover, whether it's from uh, you know backups or you know tape drives, whatever, anything off-site, 
do have what you need to decrypt your backups, you know, or your configuration files, or any of that sort of stuff. What form is it taken in? Is it you know just uh, some sort of passphrase that you're entering into the software? Do you need some sort of um, certificate to go with it? Who has that stuff if you don't have it? Uh, so let's use a certificate as an example. It's not uncommon to see these you know, certificates sitting on some sort of IT share uh, where you know the folks who need it can access it. What do you do if that's a server you're trying to recover, right? It's a little bit of a chicken and the egg type thing going on there that you won't be able to get the keys if the server's down. So make sure things like that are actually accessible ahead of time. So continuing on with the, the recovery stage here, um, failover sites. There's a variety of these. So you've got the cold failover, which generally speaking is just a spacing you might have, right? For all intents and purposes, it could be like a, a storage locker that has an extension cord running into it. Um, usually with these, you know, it'll be a matter of you need to bring in your hardware, you need to get things sort of spun up. So the turnaround time on those is awfully slow. And you've got a warm site, which is, you know, Usually not quite a mirror of production, but something that you've designed to be able to get over a lot of those workloads. Um, with these, uh, one of the first points of action that you'll need to take is bring that data back up to speed. It might be a matter of you take your latest backup so you start restoring it to the warm site, or maybe you have just find your, you know, your RPO is 12 hours and you automatically replicate every 12 hours, so you might be in decent shape. Then you've got the hot site, which everyone would love, um, and that's usually a matter of more or less a live copy of your production. The reason why we don't all have hot sites is they cost a lot of money. You've got, try, try to explain this to your accounting department, that you want to mirror your production, that's going to cost you X number of dollars, and you may never use it, right? You, you've got the heating, the cooling costs, you've got the capital expense of the actual equipment. Um, that's a hard argument to make. The larger the organization, it might actually get easier to make that argument because all of a sudden you say for every you know, hour of downtime, this is going to cost us X number of dollars versus this is what we're, you know, what's going to cost to build and maintain the uh, hot site. And a relatively new offering in the grand scheme of things is um, disaster recovery as a service. This takes all sorts of shapes and forms might be a matter of you're replicating your backup to a third party and if you push the button they'll spin those backups for you up in their own infrastructure. Um, some places will basically let you replicate directly to them so it's kind of like a hot site uh, except you're paying you're not paying for the entire facility uh, you're paying based on some sort of usage model that they have. So there's pros and cons to that you have to think about you know data security, uh, what sort of agreement do you have with these guys as far as how quickly will they jump into the action? And, you know, if it's three in the morning and some local consultant guy who just runs us out of his basement, you're probably going to be in for a bad time. <laughs> um, things like maps and directions and protocols for these failover sites. So. In a lot of cases, if your organization has some sort of dedicated failover site, uh, you probably won't be going there necessarily a heck of a lot, especially if you're part of a larger team. Don't assume everyone knows where they're going. Um, in a lot of cases, folks might you know, get brought there in the first month that they're working there, and then you know, three years later, there's a disaster, and they say, well, I kind of remember what the building looks like. That's about it. Uh, <laughs> It'd be a silly thing to lose time over if they actually have to look up where they're supposed to go. So uh, directions, phone numbers, that sort of stuff for this place. And do you have any sort of protocols for once you get there? Do they need to have a specific badge? Uh, do they need to be you know, allowed in by a, you know, is it based on some sort of access list? Are they on the list? So you don't want to forget things like that. Um, and you sort of, sort of see that throughout. There's a lot of these little tidbits that you might easily forget. And it's hard to catch them all, but you catch as much as you can. And also, who makes the call when uh, you fail over? And what's that decision based on? So, 
Now, you know, going back to the earlier uh, slide, they're saying you might spend half an hour trying to bring the app back up. Whose decision at the end of the day is it to say, you know what, we'll go push the button and send all the traffic over there? Because that's a big deal. If they're not around, who's allowed to make that decision? Um, and do they understand the consequences of making that decision? So a lot of us shift our older, older hardware off to whatever our DR site is, which is fine. You know, it's still got useful life and whatnot in it, but that has its own impact. So you've got things like, you know, it's going to be slower to bring up. Um, if this is like a cold or warm site where you're literally going through there and powering stuff on, you might find yourself sitting there for five to ten minutes waiting for a server or a SAN to boot up, right? So it's not going to be instant by any means. Um, what's the performance going to be like when you're actually running this stuff? So, you know, let's say it's you know a SAN that's four years old that you move from primary site off to your DR site. Cool, it's still functioning, you know, the disks are in good health. But it's also four years old. Is this, you know, basically a, a spinning rust sand that you got there versus an all flash that you might have in production? You're going to notice a performance hit there. Even things such as uh, bandwidth going to your DR site. What's the pipe look like there versus what do you have in head office? Firmware and software versions. Uh, you occasionally might see issues where, you know, you're deploying. Um, say vSAN or something like that. It's got fairly strict requirements as far as you know what's on the compatibility list. Does the hardware that's sitting at your DR site meet those requirements? Right? It may have for the previous version of vSAN, but all of a sudden you've upgraded to the newest and greatest and you might be a couple firmware versions behind. And lastly support issues. Is the stuff that you have there under any sort of vendor support? So you go there, you know, let's use the aging sand as an example, and you fire it up, and three of the disks start spinning red. You know, it's, let's say a RAID 6 uh, a disk group that you have on there. Well, it's shot, right? Uh, you won't be able to use it. Who do you call, right? Do you have someone to call? Uh, if you do call someone, what do you need? Do you, do you have the proper serial numbers that you need, the, the contract numbers? Or, you know, Maybe the person who made the call uh, to move that stuff there a few years ago and say, I'm going to buy a bunch of these disks off eBay and store them in the closet. Not saying that's <laughs> the greatest idea, but if they opted to do that, is that documented, right? Go to floor three and look for closet C and you know, find some disks in there. So the actual recovery process could be done in a few different methods. Are you using backups? regardless of the backup product that you use. How old are those backups? And that kind of goes back to the whole RPO thing. So take that into consideration along with, do you have everything you need to restore those backups? So I already mentioned encryption. Some software uses encryption, whether it's a um, you know, certificate or the key. Once again, do you have what you need? Are there any specific hardware requirements? Specifically, I'm thinking of tape drives in this case. So using the older hardware analogy, let's say you moved your LTO3 tape drive off-site to your DR site because you got LTO5 tapes at primary. Oh, no problem. We'll take the, uh, the tapes from primary site, restore them you know, on the DR site. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Good luck, right? Uh, hopefully you'll catch that tape air unreadable. right away. Pardon? Tape unreadable. Yeah, there you go, right? Uh, just what you want when you're going through a DR process. Script wherever you can. Um, th th this is, you know, it, you know, it'll apply to your networking gear, um, operating system configs, all sorts of stuff like that. The benefits, the big benefit really is consistency. So if you're sitting there and you know you've got downtime on your hands, you don't want to be typing in fat fingering commands or anything like that, or worse, typing the wrong command. If you've got a script that you've written when you're not under pressure and you've tested, you can just run that thing and presumably get the desired outcome. Uh, you'll also have things like time savings and, you know, as I mentioned, easier testing. If you've 
got the script running ahead of time, let's say it's for a network config on you know, a Cisco switch. It's easy enough to find a spare Cisco switch, you know, relatively same model, run that script against it. Does it work? Cool. Run it again, run it again, run it again. Right? Run it run it till you're blue in the face to make sure it does the exact same thing, exact thing that you expect it to each and every time. If you're using sand snapshots, what's the process to actually fail over to these? So I was working with, once again, some older you know, sand hardware. We were mirroring things, and the mirroring was working great. Then we found ourselves actually wanting to test the failover process. And we eventually got it, but it wasn't just a matter of right-clicking on it and saying failover. You know, we had to do all sorts of things like break the mirrors, Make sure this is primary, turn it off on you know, uh, basically what's now the secondary, remap the ESXi hosts, all that sort of stuff. So in the end, we got it. And part of the reason why we were doing it is so if we ever had to do that in a DR situation, we'd have the documentation for it. Luckily, a lot of new storage is far easier. In some cases, you can literally just right click and say fail over. And it'll talk to vCenter and do all the magic for you. But not always the case. There's plenty of software options out there. Uh, you know, you've got stuff like the VMware Site Recovery Manager, where <coughs> I wouldn't say it's easy to set up and necessarily use, but makes things significantly easier to use. Uh, there's plenty of third-party options as well. I won't really go into those. Try to stay somewhat vendor agnostic here. Um, but if you're looking for software to help you out in the time of DR, there are definitely options. And you'll send that will work into the disaster recovery as a service I mentioned easier, uh, earlier rather. You might be able to leverage their infrastructure using the software and take care of a lot of that automation during failover. So you've got things back up and running. Great, things are looking better. But now you have to do some verification. So, you'll see here the guy's trying to identify if it's wooden. Sure enough, it's wood, right? Well, you want to have some sort of baseline. Maybe he's trying to decide what sort of wood it actually is. You know, what's the quality of wood? We should try to do something similar once we've got the services back up and running on the DR site. Let's pick on the, the web developers again. Say you've got an internal web app that normally responds with a HTTP 200 code you know, within a second or so. You've got it up and running on a DR site, and it's taking 10 seconds or so. Well, why is that? I can almost guarantee it's probably some sort of stupid DNS issue, but regardless of the point, you need to know what's normal so that when they call you up badgering you saying, hey, it's broken, and you're looking at the screen that's loading there, and you're saying, no, it's working, you'll hopefully be able to find why it's broken in their eyes and why it's working in your eyes. So that will potentially help drive some SLAs. So a lot of us are familiar with service level agreements. We typically see them from fiber providers, where they'll say, we guarantee you, you know, this much throughput, you know, uptime is X number of nines. You know, if, there, you know, if a backhoe shows up and cuts through your fiber, we'll have it fixed in four hours. You could also use SLAs for on the DR side of things with regards to, OK, we'll get your uh, accounting package back up and running in two hours. But because we've got older hardware, it's only going to be you know, at 60% efficiency. So this is where you sit down with the people in charge, you know, and they say, well, no, we want 100% efficiency. You know, if we're failing over, we need to make sure we still do accounting. That's when you take out your little piece of paper, and you write a number on there with a bunch of zeros, and you sign <laughs> it across, and you say, this is what will cost. They'll cross off a couple of zeros and push it back and say, what can we get for this? And you say, 80%. So, Using SLAs is a good way to drive budget. Everyone wants 100% until they see the cost. <laughs> Give them the cost, let them make that decision, right? And it's a lot easier for them to lower the cost versus you trying to argue to bring up the budget. So business continuity. I originally put this in, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the movie Clerks, but it, it starts off where it's got a little padlock on here that's broken and you can't open it up and all day people come in saying, are you actually open? So he finally puts a sign up saying, I assure you that we're open. So I put this in there just as a little joke, but then I started thinking, 
this is actually a good point here. If you find yourself implementing your business continuity plan, depending on how your organization works, you need to let people know that you're actually open for business. If your HQ burns down and you're customer driven, make sure that your customers know, yes, we're actually up and running. Um, it's not necessarily IT's job to do that, but they might be part of getting that message out, whether it's you know, through automated emails, texting, all that sort of stuff. So you, you want to do an impact assessment. This is where you identify those key and core business processes. And you have to figure out how does IT fit into this. It'll involve lots of sitting down with folks, uh, you know, various managers, and they might say, oh yeah, you know what, we use Salesforce, so all we need from IT is a solid internet connection. You might say, cool, that's easy. Well, dig a little deeper. How do you actually use Salesforce? Well, we use our contacts in there to do all the remote calling while we're calling up clients. Oh, so you actually need you know, our SIP-based telephone system up and running too. You, know, you might find out it's tying into your email servers as well. So. They don't necessarily know the IT requirements, but you may not necessarily know the business requirements. And of course, every organization is their own special snowflake. Um, <laughs> we all operate differently. There's a lot of overlap, but there's also a lot of nuances. So I mentioned figuring out who these key players are when trying to identify the core business processes. Part of it is so that they have the insight to hopefully give you, but also part of it is to hold them accountable. If they have a share in this business continuity plan, hopefully they'll be more accountable and put more thought into, okay, let's make sure this actually succeeds. But you should also know who's above and below them and what is their, um, basically, what's their level of authority? So you kick off the BC plan and you can't get a hold of your primary contact. Who do you contact next? You might contact the person above them, and they'll say, you know what? In all honesty, that's far past my overview of what that department does. So you contact the person below them. And hopefully at that point, you can make some sort of decision based on how they want to proceed. But you need to know who those people are. And define meeting locations. So, you know, we talked about having like a failover site, this is more so on the business side. If you need to get all your sort of key shareholders together, where are they meeting? You know, last thing you want is for them to be texting each other saying, hey, let's meet at the Starbucks now that you know, it steals or something silly. <laughs> uh, set these things up ahead of time. It might be a matter of you have agreements with hotels or something nearby where you can use, you know, you've got an account with them and say, hey, we need a meeting room or five meeting rooms and you know, internet access and lots of coffee. <laughs> But same thing, you know, make sure you've got maps, contact info, anything that might be relevant so that these people can just show up without having to be told where to go. Of course, they'll still need to be reminded and probably ask, but I told you so type thing. So as sort of a, an appendix, and this applies to both the DR and BC stuff, you'll want to make sure that you have a solid list of contacts. So, you know, First point there is staff. Not necessarily an entire directory tree, but depending on your organization, you know that might be suitable. But have their contact info, so email address, uh, cell phone numbers, what office they work out of, you know what's their position, who do they report to. If you're trying to find some, you know, going back to those key contacts, if you can't reach them and you're looking for anyone in a department, you'll flip over to this. Vendors, manufacturers, um, have your support contracts handy. There's tech support numbers, so you're not fumbling on your phone trying to find, you know, what's Dell's support number. Uh, serial numbers for your hardware, anything that you might need when you reach out to them to make it as smooth of a process as possible. Application support. Uh, if you're like a SAP shop or you have a large ERP, if that's down, that's costing you. No sense in you trying to fidget it around and getting this back up and running. If you have an open support contract with them, contact these people, get them on a WebEx or whatever you can, leverage that support. If you have any preferred consultants, 
uh, we had a situation a couple of years ago where we had direct lightning hit on one of our buildings. So blew every power supply in the building, along with a bunch of other stuff. So here we are trying to get servers back up and running, you know, got them photocopiers, firewalls, switches, and we still had to replace basically power supplies in every desktop machine. <laughs> it sucked, right? <laughs> it's like, it's got to be done. Got to get users back up and running. And luckily, it happened on a Saturday morning. So my weekend was shot, but perfect timing. <laughs> um, so we actually called in a co-op that had been with us a year prior. So yeah, it was cheap labor. And he was a good co-op. And instantly, he had, he had just done the term at Cisco. So it's like, here, you do the firewall config. <laughs> but part of the value we saw in that is he knew the office. He, he knew the lay of it. He also knew where people sat. So we could give him, let's say, hey, we need you know John, Jane, and Jax power supply swap. We didn't need to draw him out of the map and you know make sure he knew where he was going. He knew the area. That might be true with consultants as well. If you have some preferred consultants, that's not just a matter of physically knowing the location. It's also a matter of actually knowing your environment, knowing the logical layouts. So that can save you some time and you know it's always nice to see a familiar face. Um, FARS, these would be folks like you know CDW, uh, soft choice. Do you have any sort of special agreement with them? Uh, once again, if your business is down, you're not necessarily going to be able to generate proper POs for them. You know, they might be squawking about you know, a payment that's late. It's not uncommon, particularly in large organizations, to have some sort of agreement that says, hey, if we invoke our VC plan or a DR plan, uh, we get you know a special net 60 versus net 30 account with you guys for X number of dollars of credit, and um, you know, pretty much anything goes there for the next little bit. You know, then bring everything back up running and pay them off, and you're happy. You're going to be working long hours, so once again, you have any sort of lodging or catering set up. So we touched on you know having a hotels, meeting rooms, that sort of stuff on the VC side, but you know, if your guys are working in the data center and trying to bring things back up, they're going to get pretty tired by about hour 14. Let's face it, pizza's only going to take you so far, right? Um, be that guy who plans properly and says, hey, you know what, let's get a good selection of sandwiches in here, make sure there's some Red Bull, don't go cheap on the coffee. So do what you can to make these people a little bit happy. And if you're just eating junk food, it's going to catch up to you, especially when you're tired. Um, HVAC, electrical facilities. Got into a great argument with facilities a while ago and the subcontractor about our AC unit that kept shutting off whenever it hit minus 17 outside. And they, they didn't seem to get that no matter how cold it was outside. It didn't mean it was cold inside my server room. <laughs> so who are the contacts for this, right? If your AC is busted, you're not going to be bringing all your servers back up and running, right? Uh, if you've got electrical problems, well, you probably don't want to be rewiring stuff yourself unless you're a certified electrician and you'll probably hear about it if you do it enough. And fuel. <clears throat> a lot of us have you know, diesel generators or something along those lines. Um, natural gas is ideal because that will work regardless of you know if there's power failure it'll still come through. But do you have any sort of agreements with uh, getting fuel delivered? Do they need to be notified? Right? Do you need to call them up and say hey you know what we, we need to start delivering fuel here. Is there some sort of window? Is it 24 hours? You don't want to find out when you've only got two hours of fuel left. Call them and say, yeah, we'll be there tomorrow. Well, that would suck. Fuel's a really interesting one because if, if you're in a situation where there's uh, like mass blackouts everywhere, everybody's going to want food fuel for their generators. So you need to make sure that you're on the priority list of that. Otherwise, you may have to wait long time. And that almost goes back to like you have a service level agreement with them, right? Some sort of guarantee saying we're willing to pay a premium for that if you guarantee it to us when we need it. As long as you have more money than the banks. Pretty much, yeah. Because they get priority. Yeah, well, or any build, build up good relationships. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a little bit of sort of a hodgepodge of stuff that, you know, food for thought. I've heard this one twice now from two different people um, storing uh, tapes in fire rated vaults. You're, you're safe, we'll be fine after the fire, contents won't be, right? <laughs> so they don't necessarily keep the heat out. Twice I've come across people who want to go retrieve uh, tapes after a fire and the tapes were melted. So 
consider things like that. Same thing with, you know, is, is it waterproof? You know, don't put it right underneath any sort of pipes. You know, keep it out of the basement. You know, moisture, dampness. Lastly, test, right? Um, as I mentioned, scripting makes things a lot easier. If you're using some sort of software-based solution, there's a good chance there's some sort of test feature in there. Use it. It's not just for show. I'm sure a lot of engineers spent a lot of time coding that thing, making them happy. And lastly, make sure it's a living document. You know, it might be as simple as having a shortcut on your desktop that you open up. You know, you put a reminder in Outlook once a month, once a quarter. Just give it a quick read through. Is it still relevant? Is there anything new in there that needs to be added? So with that, you know, it's uh, like I said, it was meant to be an intro, not necessarily an end-all, be-all. But hopefully, you've had some takeaways from this and some thoughts, and you know, hopefully, nobody ever needs to invoke their DR or BC plan. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, up next, we have um, uh, Mike Maxey from uh, 